If you would please turn in your Bibles to our scripture reading this morning, which is taken from Matthew chapter 16, specifically verses 13 to 20. Matthew 16, 13 to 20, that is our scripture reading. And then our sermon passage this morning is 2 Samuel chapter 8, all of chapter 8, verses 1 to 18. 2 Samuel chapter 8. But first, our scripture reading, Matthew 16, 13 to 20. Brothers and sisters, I remind you that this is the word of God. This word is most precious to us because it is the very word of God coming from his lips. These truly are words of gold for us. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now turning to our sermon passage, 2 Samuel chapter 8. After this, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them, and David took Metheg Amat out of the hands of the Philistines. And he defeated Moab, and he measured them with a line, making them lie down on the ground. Two times he measured to be two, two lines he measured to be put to death, and one full line to be spared. And the Moabites became servants to David and brought tribute. David also defeated Hadadazer, the son of Rahab, king of Zobah, as he went to restore his power at the river Euphrates. And David took from him 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers, and David hamstrung all the chariot horses but left enough for 100 chariots. And when the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadazer, king of Zobah, David struck down 22,000 men of the Syrians. Then David put garrisons in Aram of Damascus, And the Syrians became servants of David and brought tribute. And the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. And David took the shields of gold that were carried by the servants of Hadadazer and brought them to Jerusalem. And from Batah and from Berathai, cities of Hadadazer, King David took very much bronze. When Toy, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated the whole army of Hadadazer, Toy sent his son Joram to King David to ask about his health and to bless him because he had fought against Hadadazer and defeated him, for Hadadazer had often been at war with Toy. And Joram brought with him articles of silver and gold and of bronze. These also King David dedicated to the Lord, together with the silver and gold that he dedicated from all the nations he subdued, from Edom, Moab, and the Ammonites, the Philistines, Amalek, and from the spoil of Hadadazer, the son of Rahab, king of Zobah. And David made a name for himself when he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. Then he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom he put garrisons. And all the Edomites became David's servants. And the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. So David reigned over all Israel. And David administered justice and equity to all his people. Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was over the army. And Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahalud, was recorder. And Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were priests. And Sariah was secretary. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Karathites and the Pelathites. And David's sons were priests. Thus ends the reading of God's most holy word. Let's pray. Our gracious and most holy God, we thank you for this history of your people, but more importantly, this history of your work among your people, for your people, on behalf of them. 
Lord, the names seem strange. The names are hard to pronounce. And yet, oh Lord, we know that these names, these places, and all of the events are important because they were recorded for all time in your word. We pray, dear Lord, that you would teach us now from your word. We pray that we would learn more about it, that we would understand better the events that are described. But more importantly, dear Lord, we pray that we would learn more about you and about your faithfulness and about your power and your strength. Lord, we pray that as a result of the preaching of your word, that we would worship you all the more. That we would be better informed of how to worship you and why we should worship you. And so we pray now that you would bless the preaching of your word as well as the hearing of it. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Now you may remember that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we read of how when David proposed building a house or a temple for God in Jerusalem, that God countered by telling David that he was going to make a house or a dynasty of David's family. Well, that was in the first half of 2 Samuel chapter 7. And in the second half of 2 Samuel 7, we read David's long prayer to God in which he expressed his deep gratitude for what God had promised to do. Now, one of the promises that God made to David in chapter 7 is found in verse 9 of chapter 7, where the Lord tells David through the prophet Nathan, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones on the earth. And our passage today contains the fulfillment of that promise, that specific promise to David. But our passage is also a fulfillment of a promise that goes much further back in history than David. As one commentator helpfully points out, the land controlled by the chapter's end, that is the end of chapter 8, it matches that which is promised to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, verses 18 to 21. Which reads, on that day Yahweh made a covenant, covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. This passage then shows how, God's, how God fulfills promises both, both recent and far, far earlier. Israel reaches its apex in terms of landmass by this point in David's reign. And another commentator helpfully points out that the campaigns described in chapter 8 against these various enemies, though brief in detail, actually took about 12 years to accomplish, occurring from the years 8 to 20 of David's 40-year reign as king. By the time these campaigns had ended, David had expanded his boundaries of the kingdom in every direction, north, south, east, and west. And he controlled the major overland trade routes east of the Mediterranean Sea. As we work our way through this passage, I would ask you to, to consider this proposition, this thought. God graciously saves us from our enemies. And our only proper response is gratitude. God graciously saves us from our enemies, and our only proper response is gratitude. Well, the sermon is divided into three parts. The first, victory in every direction. The second, grateful dedication. And the third, Davidic administration. Again, victory in every direction. That's the first part of the sermon. The second, grateful dedication. And the third, Davidic administration. So let's look at the first and longest section of the sermon, uh, part one, victory in every direction. Verse one says, after this, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Metheg Amah out of the hands of the Philistines. Now, it's difficult to know if the after this refers to what had just taken place in chapter 7, after the Lord made those promises to David, or if it follows after the events in the second half of chapter 5, when David defeated the Philistines. What's confusing about this is that at the beginning of chapter 7, we read that after God had given David a rest from all of his enemies, David was settled in his house there in Jerusalem, David decided to build this temple to the Lord. 
And then in chapter 8, we have all of these battles that are being described. And so it seems as though God either hadn't given rest from all of David's enemies or the events described in chapter 8 actually precede what took place in chapter 7. Except for the fact that there seems to be a promise made to David in chapter 7 that he will make his name great, which is fulfilled in chapter 8. So it's very confusing. And as one of the commentators writes, I think very helpfully, but also somewhat unhelpfully, a precise chronology seems impossible here. It's difficult to know exactly where and when these events took place. The defeat of the Philistines in chapter 5 took place within Israelite territory, but chapter 8 deals with David's capture of Philistine lands. And so in chapter 8, David has now taken the battle to Yahweh's and his enemies. He's gone into enemy territory, and David is finding great success. So as we said, it's difficult to get the precise chronology when, uh, what happened when, but chronology isn't important to the author, as important to the author of 2 Samuel as is the sheer scale of David's victories. And these are huge victories for really what amounts to a fairly small kingdom in the ancient world. David defeated the Philistines in their own territory. The exact meaning of metheg is uncertain, but metheg means bridle or rein. And so it may just mean that David took the reins or the bridles out of the hand of the Philistines. It may refer to their capital city, the, the, the gem, the crown jewel of uh, the Philistine lands, Gath. It may be that, that David and his army defeated and captured Gath. This, you remember, is where David and his people fled to when David was fleeing from Saul. Now, we don't get much detail about what David did to the Philistines in their defeat, but we do get a sense of the brutal nature of warfare in the ancient world in verse 2, which describes the defeat of the Moabites. And we read there that David defeated Moab, and then he does something that's very strange to our ears, that's strange to us as we read about it. He had all of the soldiers of the Moabite army lay down, all those, I suppose, who had survived the battle. They were to lie down on the ground in a line head to toe, and he measured out. Three times with the line he measured out. And the first two lines of men who were lying on the ground, his men killed. He put them to death. The third line we read there in verse 2, he spared, and these Moabites became servants. Now, it may be that he spared some of them because he himself had Moabite lineage. His great-great-grandmother, great-grandmother Ruth, was a Moabitess. And that may be the reason that he decided to at least spare some of them. But in general, the members of an enemy army were destroyed. They were, they were killed in battle. And so David shows at least a certain degree of mercy to these men, at least some of them, following the battle. Verses 3 to 8 deal with David's defeat of hadad Dezer, who, as one commentator said, was, at least in this passage, apparently the exemplary loser. How would you like to be remembered? You're put in the pages of scripture and 3,000 years later in a civilization that was completely unknown or unimaginable to you, your name gets to be read and you become the exemplary loser uh, in this passage, if not really the Old Testament. Now, how to deserve, it refers both to a specific person, but also, also to his people, a people group. Verses 3 and 12 make reference to Hadad-Dezer, the son of Rahab, king of Zobah. And in between these verses, Hadad-Dezer is mentioned six times, but in those instances, the narrator is speaking of a people group. Hadad-Dezer gets so much attention because it is David's victory farthest from Jerusalem. He defeats them in battle far to the north of Damascus in Syria, up to the Euphrates River, which is quite an accomplishment. And the Euphrates River is, is a, a long river. It originates in Turkey, what's modern day Turkey. It works its way down through Syria and then down into Iraq. And then its terminus, of course, is in, uh, in the Arabian Sea, the Persian Gulf. And so David goes all the way up and he defeats, we read there, 1,700 horsemen of Hadad-Dezer's cavalry 
uh, cavalry rather, and 20,000 infantrymen. This is a large army that David seemingly wipes out quite easily. And he hamstrung, meaning he cut the Achilles tendon on all but 100 of the chariot horses, rendering them useless to any other army. That's difficult for us, I think, to hear, especially those of us who love animals, who love horses. But I think we can imagine, we can understand what would happen if these animals, if these, uh, if, if these war horses fell into the wrong hands. And those of you who are familiar with horses, with their care, their feeding, you understand what it takes to actually keep a horse alive. And so it was beyond, apparently, the means that David had. And so they saved 100 of them, rendered the others useless. And then the Syrian army came to the aid of Hadadazer. They traveled north out of Damascus, as described in verse 5, and David struck down 22,000 of their soldiers. And because Damascus is so far to the north of Jerusalem, it's outside of, of, of what had been conquered thus far by the Israelites, David put garrisons there in Damascus to maintain his power. And he also took from the uh, Syrians shields of gold and of bronze, as verses 7 and 8 say, and he brought them back to Jerusalem. And so David's name was being made great, so much so that Toy, king of Hamath, when he heard of David's victories over his, his enemy, that is Toy's enemy, Hadadazer, he decided to join David rather than to fight him and to lose uh, his uh, army in battle, as so many others had already done. And so verse 10 says that Toy sent his son Jeram to King David to pledge their allegiance to David and to bring articles of silver and gold and bronze. And this brings us to the second part of the sermon, grateful dedication. All of this tribute, along with the bronze and the silver and gold, David took as booty from all of the nations he defeated. David dedicated all of this to the Lord, as verse 11 says. And in this way, David, again, distinguishes himself from Saul because he gave the best of that which had, they had gathered from their conquered enemies to the Lord. Saul held back with the Amalekites. He kept the best of the sheep, the ox, and the fattened calves, and the lambs, and all that was despised and worthless he gave to the Lord. But all of these precious metals that came into David as victor over his enemies, he consecrated, he set apart, he sanctified unto the Lord. David understood what Saul apparently had forgotten, that God is the one who won the victory. And so all glory and honor and tribute is due unto his name. David didn't have to concern himself with making his name great. God would do that for him. Even as king, David wasn't supposed to be in it for his own glory. And it wasn't his own kingdom that he was advancing. These weren't his spoils of war that he was taking into his own treasury. These belonged to the Lord, this gold and silver and bronze. And the Lord would do fit with them as he saw fit. And as it turns out, much of these spoils would end up being used for the vessels in the uh, and in the construction of the temple. Now, verse 12 lists all of the names of the nations that the Lord defeated through David. Edom, Moab, the Ammonites, the Philistines, Amalek, Hadadazar. The treasures of all of these peoples were given to the Lord. They were set apart for him. But verse 12, along with verse 13, also show the geographic scope of David's victories. Now, this isn't a Roman Empire level of expansion, but David was now in, now in control of one of, the, one of the most important geopolitical tracts of land in the world, both at that time and still today. Why is so much attention focused on what we know, what we call, refer to as the Holy Land? Well, in part, it's because there are three of the world's major religions that consider it to be a very precious place to them. I think we understand that there is no longer uh, holy ground, per se, the way that it was understood in the Old Testament. But still, three large religions look to what we call the Promised Land, and they see it as an important place. It's a place of great history, and important, significant history. But it's also still the major land route between Europe to the north and Africa to the south. Well, 
All overland commerce between Europe and Africa went through this parcel of land. And prior to David, it had been under the control of a large number of different peoples. And the Israelites up to this point had never been able to subdue them. And part of that was because their previous king, Saul, after he had a few significant victories in battle, became so enraged at David that he, rather than pursuing his enemies, the enemies of the Lord and of his people, Saul pursued David and allowed the enemies, the Philistines and all of these other groups, the Canaanites, to, to grow and to, and to regain strength. But as verses 6 and verse 14 put it, Yahweh gave victory to David wherever he went. Dale Davis in his commentary does a good job of putting David's victories in the proper spiritual perspective. And it's a perspective that we can benefit from today. He writes in his commentary, Since David, however, is Yahweh's chosen authorized king, David's kingdom is Yahweh's kingdom. In, we might say, its introductory visible form. Wherever David reigns, there the kingdom of God holds sway. And though David's personal reign would come to an end with his death, and Israel in a few hundred years would be defeated by, uh, by others, and her people would be driven out of the land into exile, David's kingdom still served, as Davis puts it, a preliminary and principal form of Christ's kingdom. And that's why it's so important for us today. It gives us a picture in a preliminary sense, a principial way, of Christ's kingdom here on earth. David himself was imperfect. We're going to see more of that in the coming chapters. But despite his imperfections, he pointed forward to Christ and Christ's kingdom. The dedication of the precious metals to the Lord was a setting apart of material things for a holy spiritual purpose. And these things pointed to the spiritual nature of God's kingdom. So much so that when Jesus came, he spoke extensively about the kingdom of God and said the kingdom of God is at hand. But where was the kingdom of God? The Jews in Jesus' day, they were looking for a physical king. They wanted a new palace. They wanted the temple to shine bright in the fullness of glory. They wanted Jerusalem to be the capital city of the world. Where was the kingdom that Jesus ushered in? It was a spiritual kingdom. And that kingdom, like David's kingdom, it would expand. Precisely for the same reason, because God would give it the victory. In fact, Jesus promised that his kingdom, the church, would not fail. He told Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell. The church, Christ's kingdom, it has marched against the gates of hell. We're not passively sitting back. We're not waiting for Satan to come and attack us. We are on the march. And Satan is on the defensive, brothers and sisters, and he has been defeated. He just doesn't fully realize it yet. The church, God's kingdom here on earth, is expanding, it is growing. And while we may not see it as dramatically as it has been seen in other points in the church's history, Christ is building his kingdom. He is calling sinners to himself. Christ's church is the earthly manifestation of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And God will give his church the victory. Our job is the same as Peter's. To confess Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon that confession, that rock, Christ will build his kingdom. Ours is not a physical kingdom. We're not hoping to overthrow any earthly government and install a theocratic administration. That is not our goal. It's not the goal of the church. Study the whole Holy Roman Empire and see how well that worked out for people. We are here to set apart Jesus Christ as Lord. We are here to proclaim his victory over sin, death, hell, and the devil. We are here to express our gratitude for what Christ has done for us. That's why we're here. And in so doing, we will expand God's spiritual kingdom here on earth. And it will be visible to all the inhabitants of the earth on that day when Jesus Christ returns. And that brings us to the final point of the sermon, Davidic administration. 
The expansion of the kingdom meant an expansion of David's administration. As the previous verses show, David ruled from the Euphrates to the north and to the east down to the Valley of Salt, which is the plain that extends south from the Dead Sea, which possibly goes as far as the Red Sea. His kingdom extended west to the Mediterranean Sea. He had garrisons of soldiers in Damascus. He had garrisons of soldiers all over Edom to the south in order to maintain control of those regions. And we read in verse 15 that David reigned over all Israel and David administered justice and equity to all his people. And we long for that day when our king will administer justice and equity. We long for that day when Jesus, the Christ, our Messiah, when he will return. That's the promise that we read about in Matthew chapter 12, verse 20 and 21. God will not crush us. He will not quench us. We are waiting for that day when the Lord brings justice to victory. And he will. And David's administration was a picture of that justice. It was a picture of the equity which Christ Jesus will bring. As King David was also the supreme judge of Israel, he was the highest court of the land, the highest level disputes would come before him. And Joyce Baldwin says in her commentary that the pattern for the judge was the goodness and reliability of God himself and presupposed godliness in the one administering justice. We read that Joab, who was David's nephew, he was the top general over the army, and Jehoshaphat was the recorder whose title was derived from the Hebrew word to remember. It was Jehoshaphat's job to remember, to write down, to chronicle. Perhaps, we don't know, perhaps it was Jehoshaphat who wrote the books of 1 and 2 Samuel. And so he served as the chief historian of Israel, whose main job it was to remember what the Lord had done in saving his people. Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, served as priests. Sariah was the secretary, or as good Presbyterians would put it, the clerk. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Carathites and the Pelethites. Their special responsibility, the Carathites and the Pelethites, was to guard King David. They were his imperial guard. And interestingly, the Carathites were from Crete. They weren't even Jews. They weren't Hebrews. The Pelethites came through Crete but weren't native to it and ended up serving David as a part of his personal entourage. And it's thought that since these men were foreigners to Israel, this would minimize inter-tribal conflict among the men who guarded the king. No particular tribe could lay claim to having the special privilege of guarding the king. And finally, we read that David's sons were priests. Now, as you read that, as we read that together this morning, you might have thought that's a little strange. Is David a Levite? Was he from the priestly tribe of Israel? No, he wasn't. David was a Judahite. They weren't supposed to be priests, not, certainly not in any technical sense. And so how do we understand this? The main options are that they weren't actually priests in the full sense of the word, but were mere administrators for the priests, or perhaps Since David participated in priestly activities such as offering sacrifices to the Lord, his sons could do so as well. Now it's possible, and this may be the reason that the the author of 2 Samuel puts it in here, it's possible here that David is pushing the boundaries with his sons in an unlawful way, placing them in the priesthood where they should not have been. And one commentator suggests that this might possibly be a foreshadowing of David's coming moral downfall which begins in just a couple of chapters. But then, as now, it is the Lord, Christ himself, who is building his kingdom, his church. Then, as now, Christ the Lord is drawing sinners to himself. He is plucking sinners from the perils of sin and death and hell. Then, as now, Christ has given to his church those who hold offices, who are there for the commonwealth of the members of his kingdom. Then as now, he is placing outsiders into the sun. He's drawing people to himself. And Christ is our king who is on the march. Christ does not grow weary. 
he doesn't lose focus. Christ is not going to gaze out of his window and be enticed by what he sees. Christ always has as his focus, as his purpose, his people. He does not fail. Christ is the victory. And you and I owe him a debt of gratitude because he has already done our work for us. He's already done that which is required of us. And so it's our duty to be gratefully obedient to all that he has commanded us to do. And when we fail, it's our duty to confess, to repent, to serve the Lord and to serve one another. We do this because Christ has already won the battle. Christ has already gone through the deep waters. Christ has already faced down our enemy. We simply are waiting for that day when the last enemy, death, will be destroyed. And that day is coming, brothers and sisters. And it's coming soon. So let us not lose focus. But let us not fail to be grateful for what Christ Jesus has done for us. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we are thankful. We are grateful for what you have done. We are grateful for how you have cared for us, how you have given us all that we need, how you have won the battle. We're thankful that each and every day and all the battles that we face, Lord, you have gone before us and you have overcome. We're grateful that we are able to march behind you. We're thankful, dear Lord, that our battle is not against that which is physical. That fellow human beings are not our true and eternal enemies. We're thankful, Lord, that we don't have to try to establish an earthly kingdom. And that as the church militant, we aren't fighting against our fellow image bearers physically with the sword. We're thankful, dear Lord, that you are building your spiritual kingdom. And that Christ Jesus is her king. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you continue your great and wonderful work. That you continue to call all men all women, all children, all sinners to yourself. The battle belongs to the Lord.